Hi everyone, good afternoon. It's so great to be here. Um, this afternoon's session is focusing on health justice amid uh, environmental crises. And the focus today is gonna be really paying attention to water injustice from the position of marginalized uh, peoples, indigenous peoples, with a, a view to try to see how to incorporate a much more human rights-based approach. We've got four really fantastic speakers. Oh, before I introduce them, I want to introduce myself. <laughs> in case you just think I just walked in off the Eastern Road, which I did. Um, <laughs> um, I'm Professor Patricia Kingori. I'm a sociologist based at the University of Oxford. And I get to introduce you to <laughs> Nicola Redvers, uh, Shadonna Kettle, Professor M uh, Marla Rao, and Claire Thomas. They'll introduce themselves much more in relation to the, their presentation. So I'm going to hand over now to you. Should we get going? Sure. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, for those that were here this morning, and but for new faces, my name's uh, Nicole Redvers. I'm a member of the Deninukwe First Nation, which is uh, in what we call Treaty 8 territory, or the eighth treaty with the British Crown in subarctic Canada, otherwise known as Denende, or Land of the Peoples. Uh, we're Dene peoples and we've been living on our lands for thousands and thousands of years. One of the, the luck of our placement within uh, what's called the Northwest Territories of Canada, which is uh, just north, if people are familiar with the geography of Canada from Alberta. Alberta's uh, right below us. And in Northern Alberta, uh, there's one of the largest open pit bitumen mines in the world, which is otherwise known as the Oil Sands Project in Canada, or the Alberta Oil Sands Project, which has been in operation uh, since the early 1950s, although it ramped up production in the 70s. There's been decades of calls, particularly from First Nations communities who live downstream from the oil sands operation, including my home community, which lives downstream from the oil sands operation, for baseline health assessments and ongoing health, health assessments uh, uh, from the potential and real impacts of the oil sands operations. Is it ringing a little bit? Hello? Yeah. There we go. All right. Is that better? Yeah. Nobody likes ringing. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, decades of calls from communities for uh, baseline health assessments, uh, which have been unfortunately not engaged. Just this last spring, the oil sands uh, came out with notice that one of their tealings ponds which is basically a pond of uh, toxic material as a leftover byproduct from the oil sands was leaking into the environment. However, what was not apparent at, at that moment was that in fact it had been leaking for a year from that site without any public notice despite some of the, the legal policies in place for communications with communities uh, down river from the oil sands projects. And then it came out that in fact the tailings ponds had been leaking for years. Um, backing up some of the concerns from the communities on increasing cancer rates as well as uh, uh, many other health impacts. Still to this day, despite the billions of dollars of operations of the oil sands, we have never had a health assessment done in our communities, either baseline or ongoing from the impacts of the oil sands, despite repeated calls. Uh, we've faced barriers in trying to gain research funding, uh, both from the uh, provincial, territorial, and federal governments, as well as uh, from research organizations in Canada to carry out this testing on behalf of communities. In fact, they've put money forward for the animals, but they have not put money forward for the humans as a part of the process. So the animals are being tested, but the humans are not. The, the impacts of this type of process on our communities has been visceral because one of the recommendations to communities was to not eat our traditional foods, particularly the organ meats, which are delicacies in our communities, but unfortunately concentrate some of the heavy metals when they're embodied within the environment. 
So a lot of elders and community members, particularly in close proximity to the oil sands, stopped eating many of their traditional foods, stopped drinking water from the locales because they were worried about the contamination. So what, what has ended up happening is a situation where it's not only the health impacts from the potential toxicants, but it's the health impacts from the loss of culturally sound, nutritious foods because many folks are going now to eat commercial products from the store, which lack a lot of nutrition comparatively to our traditional foods. On top of the mental wellness impacts, because when we harvest the caribou, for example, it's not only about the meat of the caribou. We use parts of it for our medicine. We scrape the hides and we use it to make our moccasins. We use it to make our bags. We use it to make our jewelry and our earrings. In fact, we use the leg bone of the caribou to be able to be used as a tool for scraping our hides. So all of the, the practices is, is not only just from the health effects of the toxicants, it's the impacts on our food sources, it's the impacts on being able to carry out culture, all stemming from the environmental contamination of water that has continued to be minimized because there's only hundreds of us downstream from that mine and it's billions of dollars of industry. So I just wanted to open up with that story because uh, it's very real and personal to me. It's not just a story in a newspaper or otherwise. It's my life, it's my family's life who continues to live there who's faced with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Merci. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Good. Um, thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you to Land Body Ecologies and MRG for this invitation to be part of this panel. So, thank you. Um, so I wanted to start with a video that's not there, unfortunately. <laughs> so never mind, but I'm going to ask you to imagine that you are on a journey along the river in Esmeraldas. Esmeraldas is in the northernmost part of Ecuador. So that kind of beige color you see bordering with Colombia. And to the right of Esmeraldas is Imbabura, uh, in the purple, and above that, Karachi, which is green. These, two, these three provinces are um, where you will find large uh, populations of people of African descent, so they're kind of ancestral territories in Ecuador. And Esmeraldas is known as the Gran Comarca, or the Re República de los Sambos, the Great Kingdom or Republic of Sambos because of the history um, of rebellion of people of African descent and indigenous, indigenous peoples who rose up against the Spanish conquistadors. And it's today Esmeraldas is known as the cradle of Afro-Ecuadorian history, culture, cosmologies and epistemologies and sadly, sadly neglect. Part of my PhD research looks at demands for reparations among people of African descent in Ecuador. And um, so reparations, reparatory justice, and repair. So reparations for what, reparations from whom, and reparations in what form might be some of the questions that you're asking. These are some of the questions that I'm tackling in my research. I contributed um, to an article recently by MRG, which you will probably hear about later in this panel. And I wrote about the reasons, oh, there it is, the reasons why people of African descent in Ecuador need repair. Let me tell you a bit about es, uh, Afro Esmeraldeños. So in Esmeraldas, 70% of the population is of Afro descent. 85% of those people of African descent live in abject poverty. 23% have access to basic services. Um, so they lack services such as housing, health, and water. Um, just losing my point here. And 64% of urban houses have access to public water services. But sadly, in some parts of the province, like Eloy Alfaro and San Lorenzo, the water infrastructure is woefully inadequate. 
here, I don't know if this is going to play now. Okay. Uh, this is a photo of a riverine community in Tambillo, and these fishermen are heading out to carry out traditional fishing for conchas, or clams as we know them in English, prawns and other fish. This is a traditional practice that they have been carrying out for centuries. In this slide here, and the next slides, you can see these women are using the sea to engage in um, paying homage to the goddess Yemanya. Yemanya um, is from the, is an Orisha from the Yoruba religion in Nigeria. So the sea for the fishermen, the sea for these women here is important to continue um, engaging in cultural practice, religious practice, and spiritual practice. I'm going to show you another slide here where we see a picture of uh, a young adolescent, a young Afro-descendant um, child, child essentially, collecting water from a pipe. And we don't know if this water is potable. Imagine this is how you had to collect water. Imagine this is your child having to collect water in this way. Um, imagine that you had to rely on water trucks to deliver water to fill the refillable gas tank that you have at home because you don't have access to running water in your home. By the way, this is going to cost you between 20 to 40 pounds for eight gallons because you haven't had wa running water in your house between two weeks, three weeks, to a month. I'm going to end with some words here from participants that I've um, had, um, sorry, participants who have helped me in my investigation. Uh, and here I'm going to start with Ismael, who says, Esmeraldas drinks that should say blood instead of water, because there isn't any potable water. So far in March, it's another month without potable water. Children beg for water instead of food. So because of the high poverty indexes in Esmeraldas, children are either asking you for food or water. So they're having to choose between the two. Uh, between the two. I'm moving on to Mirian, who says, referring to these water storage tanks, quite often us Esmeraldeños are without water for two weeks, three weeks, even months. Sadly, people are used to living like this. In Esmeraldas, people cannot live without water tanks, but not everybody can afford them. In the more precarious parts of Esmeralda, Esmeralda city, there is hardly any water, but they continue paying bills. This is absurd because poorer people are paying for a service that is not even being delivered. I'm going to end on Ismail's words. Black lives do not matter. Remember that Esmeraldas is 70% of the population is of Afro descent and they don't have access to running water. And that's where I'm just going to leave it there. Well, I mean, I, I have to say I'm in absolute awe of the uh, paddle I'm sitting here with because um, I'm wondering wh what, what particular hat I should wear today. I'm a public health physician by background. My name is Mala Rao. I'm a senior clinical fellow at Imperial College London in the School of Public Health. Uh, and I have long years, about four decades, of working in the National Health Service in this country or with the National Health Service. And that includes in the global arena. So my career has spanned um, practice, hands-on public health policy at the national level here, uh, and then uh, as the inaugural director of the first Institute of Public Health in India, and then back on to global public health where I've done both policy development, uh, mostly in Southeast Asia, uh, and a little bit in this, in this country. I think the main things uh, I've been working on recently have been interestingly and rather serendipitously getting involved in race equality in our workforce. But because I've been uh, 
uh, interested in, concerned about, written about, advocated on uh, the climate crisis and health for something like two and a half decades, I now focus my attention on that intersection between race, gender, uh, and, and uh, climate. The other hat uh, I wear is um, as Vice Chair of Water Aid, uh, which fits very well with my, uh, you know, my, my public health professional, professional role. And that has um, given me huge insights, things I knew about. I knew about water scarcity and water stress, uh, but um, actually being part of water trade, I recognize some of what Shadona has been saying and have more stories that I can bring, particularly from Southeast Asia. I am the chair of the expert group uh, for the environment, de environmental determinants of climate and health for Southeast Asia, which is the region of WHO uh, that has disproportionately the highest level of more mortality and morbidity from uh, uh, climate impacts. So uh, that's where I'm coming from. And I just had a, uh, uh, we, were, we were all asked to prepare uh, kind of five minutes. And I wasn't sure whether today I wanted to ask for more help with um, transforming uh, medical education to take on a more planetary uh, dimension or whether I wanted to focus just on the water because both these things are so interrelated. But I want to say something about leadership, actually. So I'm going to read out a statement I prepared. I think the world has never needed leadership and thinking of a different kind more than it does today. The climate crisis is evident in every region, and we are facing an existential threat. And this is not just a scenario which, until recently, we might have happily confined to the realms of um, you know, a third grade scary science, science fiction uh, movie. Even scientists not generally given to display of emotion are asking whether uh, anthropogenic climate change, you know, might result in worldwide societal collapse or even eventual human extinction. Uh, yet the latest forecast is we're just carrying on and we're on track for up to 2.6 degrees temperature rise by 2100. That is catastrophic, but of even greater and more immediate relevance is the, uh, that the global warming is set to crash through the guardrail of 1.5 degrees as early as 2027 if emissions continue to rise at the current rate. Water scarcity is perhaps the most significant climate adversity we're facing in terms of its magnitude and scale of impacts. In fact, it's predicted that that's going to be the biggest reason for migration uh, in, in future. And we all know, do we not, um, that, that you know, without water, there's little point in uh, trying to provide uh, you know, other forms of health care in, in, in uh, places where they're, they're performing surgery without um, uh, you know, running water being available, let alone hot and cold water. So I'm going to stop there by saying, you know, it's the most vulnerable communities, of course, that um, suffer the most with this. But it's truly um, inspirational the way they're not waiting for us to find solutions. They're out there innovating and, and finding ways around these appalling adversities. They are our leaders. We need their knowledge and wisdom to help transform the, the, the terrible state um, that our planetary health is in at this point in time. So that's, that's my position. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's quite hard to be the last speaker in a panel like this, but I'll, um, I'll give it a go. So um, I've only got five minutes, and Sam asked me to tell some stories, so I'm going to tell some stories very, very quickly. Um, they, they're most of them um, appear in this publication, which is available online. So if you want to read more about this, the, stu the subject of this panel, there's loads more in there, and, and some of the speakers um, have, have chapters in there as well. Um, so the first story concerns a community in Somalia. So the, 
they're a community, they're IDPs, they're living on someone else's land. There's a borehole on the land and there's a petrol pump that is used to pump water from below ground to the service, surface, and this is what they rely on. Um, a caring agency, international national agency, comes along and says, um, you're having to pay for your water at quite high cost. And one of the reasons for that is because the landowner has to pay for the petrol to pump the water. So let's do something good here. Let's put a solar power pump on this borehole pump. So the, the landowner won't have any cost. So your water cost should drop. And what happens? They do all of this work. It works. The landowner puts the price of the water the, the rationale for the landowner, the pricing the water, was not what it was costing him to bring it to the surface. It was something else that we still don't know. It was how fun fancy the pump was. But the real tragedy about this story is that I was not allowed to tell the agency that did that piece of work. So this story emerged in a piece of research we were doing. I was not allowed to pass on the feedback to the agency because the community said, if you tell him, if you tell them, the landowner will kick us off our land. So this is about the communities not having a voice and having zero trust in the process and not being asked and us kind of like assuming we know what the logic is when we don't. So just coming back to Dr. Rao, there are solutions and local people have the solutions, but we, we actually have to ask those local people. Um, this is um, a picture of um, someone who happens to be a religious minority worker in Pakistan. So he's the sanitation worker. The story I want to tell you concerns... Um, so these, these are caste-like communities in, in a Muslim country, I add. Um, so not in India, where caste is best known. Um, who go down the sewers to unclog them when they get blocked. It's a very, very tough job. As you can see, they do it with no personal protective. It's a, it's a health disaster, um, but it's also a health and safety disaster. So the story I want to tell you is about um, a worker who got into trouble down one of these sewers. The fire and rescue refused to go down to rescue him. So some of his colleagues went down. And the, the reason I chose this page from the report is the small photo. You can see that other sewer workers are trying to help someone who's got into difficulty. In the end, two of the people who went down to help died. And we, we're still working with his widow. We, we tried to get her to bring a claim against the company. Um, they kind of paid her off. Um, she was working for them as a litter picker. She's now been sacked. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, very difficult situation. Water Aid is also involved with this situation and trying to make a difference. But these situations are very intractable and as well as um, the water issue, we have issues of, of shame and uh, discrimination. And then the third story I just want to tell you very briefly is about a community in northeastern India where they live in a, an area which is um, crisscrossed by rivers. And women in that community were really struggling to get health care, antenatal care, post postnatal care. And the health authorities said and continue to say, we can't get staff there. There's no bridges. There's, you know, it's too in inaccessible. The community, so the, 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 the government sees the water as a barrier, as a problem. The community has an NGO. The NGO got a boat. They put a clinic on the boat. The boat goes up and down the river. And it serves the women. So, we have, you know, again, it's about the people in the community having the solutions and not, and not seeing things from our way that uh, how a clinic should be, but, but say, let's have a floating, a floating clinic. Let's work with the context and with the environment and with the local knowledge that people have, which is so important. And this picture also talks about the spi spirituality of, of the relationship with water and how it's not just about... Um, uh, bodily health and, and sanitation and washing, but also very much about indigenous religions and communities. And the last thing I just want to say, I'm, I'm sure most of you know about the SDGs. This is the water SDG, and it's just one of the targets. I just want you to notice that the target includes the word equitable access. And the uh, indicator, just the word equitable just disappears. 
So at some level, Dr. Rao was saying um, we need local leaders. Um, what well, we have, we, 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 there is leadership, but maybe the, those leaders are not quite in the right places at the moment. So it's about, um, it's about power, and it's about um, communities that don't have power won't have access to water. They also won't have access to food or land or jobs. Water is just kind of one symptom of the way in which the lack of power and the lack of the ability to influence people means that you don't get heard and you don't get served. Thank you. Is this working? Okay. Thank you. And um, thanks again. This is just so brilliant. We have 15 minutes um, of question and answers from the audience, if anybody has any questions. Pardon? <laughs> Sorry about this, it's just a little backstage making sure this is all right. Now I actually want to just open it up to the audience actually for questions. So um, we've got one at the back. I will just say, can you please wait until the mic comes to you because then we can't then hear you. So I think there was a man at the front with the T-shirt and we've got somebody at the back with the blue T-shirt. So, so we have the person at the back, yeah, first, if, we, if they can have a mic and then we'll come to you after. Hi, um, my name's Sagar. My, my region in India is Northeast India where a lot of the indigenous tribes are. And um, in my research in the last few years, which is on water research, when I looked at the reports of a lot of mining companies, there's anything between five million to 50 million liters of water that's used up per mine per day for a mine. It can vary. And when I looked at one of the companies, they've got, you know, they're reporting on the coal mining, but they're also reporting on all the other resources required for renewables. So I'm hearing a lot about we've got to stop the coal, but we've also got to start taking a look at why do we need these wind car, solar panels, electric cars, wind turbines, which are fully reliant on everything from the engine in the wind turbine it's fully reliant on using fossil fuels, hundreds of liters every year for all these products. So my question is, is that in the water usage of, that is taken from these forests by stealth force, and we also lose a lot of our herbal medicine traditions as well, i.e. Ayurvedic medicine in India. My question is, is that how, um, how do we actually proclaim back the sovereign rights of the water and the soil and all the other elements that come with it when a lot of the products that we require in 2023 for this transition is also wholly reliant on removing those resources at the same time? We want green technology, but to get green technology, we have to take someone else's forest. We have to take someone else's traditions. We want healthcare, but what sort of healthcare do we want? Modern Western healthcare or Ayurvedic healthcare, which is of crossing five traditions from Muslim to Tibetan to Hindu? What traditions and what medicine systems do we want? That's all focused around water. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want anybody in particular to answer that question, or did you, do you want to? Does anybody feel confident answering that? Do we have more? Yeah. Do you want to? Let me have a go. Obviously, <laughs> I don't have a, a perfect, uh, uh, you know, solution. If 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 there were one, uh, you know, I I guess some of us would have agitated for it by now. It's just that we have ended up creating such a complex uh, 
a world with, with so many things uh, inextricably linked. Uh, so to solve one thing, you end up you know, uh, creating a problem elsewhere. And you're absolutely right. Look at the fact that um, you know, electric cars, we think that's the, the, uh, the, the, the solution, but the lithium uh, uh, mining and the cobalt and you know, what that's doing in terms of environmental degradation and loss of water resources in some parts of the world and uh, wars and conflict because of it. So, so you're, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, the water issue uh, has, since, since the time we've had um, uh, environmentalists who uh, first publicized the fact that uh, you, know, you have to extract a huge amount of water to produce a can of Coke. You know, and that happened in India. And, and, and we know uh, the extent to which they were censured and, and excluded when they, when they protested in, the, in, in that way. So I, I think water has been uh, generally assumed to be a free good. It's freely available, and it's only now that we're beginning to recognize there's a cost here, and, we co and, and, and that actually it's the poorest that are paying the heaviest price. Uh, that knowledge has arrived, that, that awareness has arrived, but we haven't, we, we haven't found solutions. For those communities in that area, mining offers an opportunity for employment. At the same time, it's destroying their lives. So there are some horrendously difficult choices they end up having to make. So I have no solution, but there are at least, um, I think as Claire was mentioning, non-governmental organizations that are powerful enough, knowledgeable enough, and united enough to be bringing that knowledge to world attention and beginning to do something about it. And the same applies with medicine. I think, I think there's a lot I, I could say, I could go on for hours, but at least let's begin by having a bit of humility, I think, on the Western side, recognize that what we have, this very binary way of looking at things, is largely driven by uh, colonial ideas, you know, this 18th century enlightenment, uh, and this idea of science and having to get rid of superstition and indigenous knowledge and all the rest of it, that, that, that hasn't really worked, and, and that we need a better balance and some humility in, in bringing about approaches that, that uh, respect uh, the best of uh, European science, Western science, as well as the best of uh, indigenous uh, medicines. I, I would just add to that, that it, I mean, it was a huge question, so it's quite hard to answer. But um, if, you, if you talk to the indigenous peoples, they, they have a, a, a completely different approach to how they see nature and the land and the human's relationship with that. And they also have a different approach to um, minds and bodies as, as being much, much more integrated. So I think, there's, I think if we are to successfully uh, make any kind of switch from a very destructive path that we seem to be on, listening to the indigenous peoples and, and trying to understand how they have learned over centuries to, to be part of nature, to live and in sustainability, in sustainable ways within the, the, the lands that they have inhabited. I think there is some hope in terms of moving forward, um, but it does require a very big change and it's, and it's not clear it's a change the world is willing to, to make at the moment. And, and it would just be a tragedy if we realized we needed the indigenous peoples at the point at which, you know, the last communities were, were no longer able to practice their culture and were no longer to sh able to share those philosophies with the rest of the world, which we're not that far away from, from being in the position of, sadly. Thank you. Um, we had uh, another question, a third from the front here. Put your hand up again to go and see. Thanks very much for an excellent panel. Um, I <coughs> I work at a UN agency uh, for food security as an environment, climate, and gender division, 
And I was, there's a lot of talk um, among the UN kind of ecosystem and globally about indigenous people and the phrase kind of transformational change and these kind of things. Um, but I suppose like the previous question kind of flagged a lot of the aims can be mutually incompatible. Like, like was mentioned, you know, 78% of lithium and cobalt is within 30 miles of, of native land in America. Like, what is the way, or what is the global way, I suppose, that these kind of points of view of indigenous people can become enshrined in a way that equivalates for the difference in power between these huge international uh, structures like the UN or others which are predicated on kind of current financial flows, really. And how does that, is it loss and damages? Is it, is it something else that we, can't, we haven't discussed yet? Like, how do we balance that scale in a way that actually allows us to really create, go beyond just calling it transformational change and kind of dismissing it or agreeing to it in a kind of a toothless agreement and actually change things on a power basis between kind of indigenous people and, and these kind of global frameworks that we have to work in, I suppose. Thank you. Two great questions. Eva. Do you feel confident to answer that, Nicole? Yeah, so I think one, uh, I mean, speaking because we're talking a little bit more about climate change and I'll just maybe use that as an example. So with the COP processes that happen, indigenous communities have been trying to become uh, voting members or, or members of, of that process, but so far have been through decades of processes of becoming observers and being able to sit in the room but don't actually have a final decision making even though indigenous communities see themselves as sovereign nations outside. That becomes even more complicated when you have nation states that don't recognize indigenous peoples as a peoples. Um, we heard from a panel this morning, of course, in the case of Thailand where indigenous peoples are, are not recognized as a peoples. Um, but that is one way in my mind where our communities have been calling for is decision-making space at some of these international tables. Um, just recently, about uh, in uh, April of this year, was the very first time that the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues passed a member study on the indigenous determinants of health, was, which was the first time that health, the health of indigenous peoples was passed in a study at the United Nations level. Three weeks after that, the World Health Assembly passed a resolution on the health of indigenous peoples, which was the first time that the World Health Assembly has ever passed a resolution on the health of indigenous peoples. So because of those movements happening this year, what's been interesting is that there's been a global study now put forward to say, okay, well, we're gonna have three years, we're gonna study and create a global plan on indigenous health, which really is the planet's health because indigenous health means the planet's health. But the, the process for that, from what I've seen so far, has been outreach to non-indigenous experts to be able to create this global report. <laughs> so, and I know the guy that got reached out to who reached out to me and said, hey, they're asking me. And you know, th so this is the problem that we have is that there's still this patriarchal colonial approach that indigenous people don't know best, despite there being many more of us around that have skill sets and ability and policy tables, academic tables, the rest of it, yet we're still assumed not to be experts in our own lives. So these are small little mechanisms within these international agencies. The head of UNESCO traditional knowledges right now is a white man who covets that space. I mean, th these, are, these are things where we as indigenous people have been voicing without success, but if we had more people calling to say, why is there a white guy? the head of indigenous traditional knowledge is at UNESCO. I mean, these are the types of questions we need other people to be asking as well. Just going to chime in. Can you hear me? Or is it? Yeah, so given my research on reparations, um, part of it is trying to understand what transformational justice looks like, right? So whether we use the word change and justice, you know, it's essentially we need to change the system. And I think um, taking on what everybody else has said is this kind of, kind of reimagining the world, essentially, because 
as it, as it stands, the world is not working for everybody. And we know that indigenous peoples and um, you know, people of African descent uh, across the world, the diaspora, who are in fact indigenous peoples of Africa, right? Um, you know, people in Esmeraldas, for example, they know it's an ancestral territory. They know how the land works. Um, the same goes for the other ancestral territories throughout the world. Um, essentially, is about repairing, it, repairing systems so that we have um, a new framework to work from, I would say. Thank you. Did you want to add? Oh, no, I just wanted to add that uh, we haven't even particularly uh, you know, dented the issue of gender equality, let alone bringing in indigenous, uh, you know, the indigenous voice. So there is just so much to do. And, and again, you know, in, 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 uh, it's very similar to what Nicole was saying. You may find some agencies where uh, it, it's very evident that a woman uh, leading that would be a, a good idea, and yet, you know, it, 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 it may not happen. So you see that so much of the time. Um, even using words like uh, menstrual hygiene or how people manage their periods in uh, places where saline intrusion of water, if you look at Bangladesh, uh, there is so much saline intrusion because of sea level uh, rise. Maintaining menstrual hygiene is so difficult. And yet, it's only now that we are even putting these things in reports and using the M word in our in our reports, you know. So, so there's a there's a long way to go in 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 this in this whole arena. But I, again, um, you know, uh, Nicole's point about made me wonder whether yes, we need indigenous representation, we need women representation in that leadership. But do we also need to bring on the global north, all of the global north, where it is this unsustainable consumption, this non-reciprocal, highly extractive way of life that has emerged over 300 or 400 years of you know, being colonial powers? Uh, it, it, how do we bring them along? That's a question uh, I would ask, because the power sharing will come when they absolutely recognize that we're all in this together. Maybe, maybe I will just add um, just a note of positivity because the UN did sign the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So that is, I mean, there is a, a mechanism. And it does say that Indigenous peoples have free, prior and informed consent for the lands that they have occupied. So if, if you want to do development, if you want to build a mine, our first question is shaking his, his head because it's not respected. So it's, it's not a panacea, it's not solving things. Um, in one recent case, um, at the African regional level, um, uh, the Ogiek community have won the right to go back to their land, to be in their forest. So the regional court has directed the government to let them back in the land and to make reparations. The government hasn't done it yet. It's still, it's still a battle we're fighting. Um, but there are, there are a, few, um, a few moves of that kind in the right direction. Um. Thank you. We have two other questions. Um, oh, three. <laughs> okay, should we start at the, the front and then we move to the back? Um, well, my question is because the, um, there's a choice whether indigenous people or political leaders um, should be the ones to make the decisions. And if they have contrasting ideas, uh, who should we listen to? Because the government has all this modern technology and they know how to use it better, but the indigenous people are the ones facing the problems. So they should technically be the ones deciding the solutions. Um, so whose idea should we listen to? I mean, it's not for me as moderator to say who's asked the best question, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm going to um, open it up to the speakers who wants to answer that question or feel that they want to answer that. Our elders have stories where a lot of our young people that are coming into the world today are our old elders coming to help us through this time of great change. That the energy of the young people and the, the common sense and the empathy that's coming forth in these new generations are just so apparent with the, with the, the idea that the world can be simple if we want it to be simple. And I always say that you can't solve complex problems in the world from the same worldview that created it in the first place. You can't solve complex problems from the same worldview that created it in the first place because it continues to perpetuate the disconnect between us and the planet as relatives, which is how we see our relations. And I just wanna say, speaking of water, because we have teachings in our communities of our bodies being of nature. We are nature. We're not separate from it. We don't go in a park. We don't go walk out in nature. We are in and of itself nature. And the way I talk to that about with scientists, with researchers, and even with clinicians is that many people learn in their biology class that our bodies are made up of 60% water, right? Everybody heard that fact. We're made up of 60% water. So I always ask, where does your water come from out of your tap? You'd be surprised how many people don't know. Which water body does your water come from that you drink from your tap, if you're lucky enough to drink out of a tap? And here it's the Thames River, yes? So if you've been in London for two to three months, 60% of your body becomes that river. You are sitting here as as rivers, as the Thames River. You're sitting here, the lakes of the rivers of where you come from. Each and every one of those water molecules that is within your body, that H2O, every single one didn't just come from that river, it was somewhere else before that. And before that it was somewhere else. Before that it was somewhere else. Maybe part of me was floating over the Amazon. Maybe it was floating over Adivasi territory. Maybe it was floating in Sami territory. The amount of wisdom that comes within that 60% of the water that's embodied within the rivers and lakes that are sitting all in this room, you are in and of itself nature. And this is why if the water is not healthy, we are not healthy. Because we don't see ourselves as separate from it. We are completely and utterly interconnected. And we forget about that. We are nature. So I want to thank you for your question. <laughs> Okay, we have another two questions. So from the middle and then, well, middle back and then all the way at the back, if that's okay. Okay. Hi, um, my name's Kerry and I work for a climate change charity in London that sits between the public and private sector, specifically in the built environment. We work with a lot of large organizations who, when we put this issue on the table of embodied debt in regard to their operation of extremely extractive processes as a result of our uh, lifestyles in, in the modern era. Uh, a lot of the times what we hear back is uh, an inability to conceptualize that debt, uh, and <laughs> which obviously derives from a, a concept of understanding nature, the way we understand nature here is completely different um, on the ground of where they are extracting from. Um, and also an issue of confused responsibility, which often comes in the form of wanting it to be on someone else's shoulders. <laughs> um, what would you say to these organizations in if they were going to change tomorrow uh, in terms of specific steps or uh, changing the framework in regards to implementing how they not only operationally change, but also how they conceptualize nature, getting that, that message into their minds, given the model that they sit in, that, that chair that they sit in, is one that their only goal is, is creating something, is profit. It's, it's a very different language. That sort of opens to the panel, so it's quite a complex question. 
I mean, it's definitely true that the profit motive and um, specifically the need to make profit now or soon um, is a huge part of the problem and how we've got ourselves. Um, and I was going to tell a story earlier, um, but I didn't, but I will now, which was from a panel I watched where you are now yesterday, where an indigenous uh, person of indigenous heritage from Indonesia uh, told us a story about her community who are very, very strongly attached to their land. And a man drove up in a truck with a suitcase full of money and said, give me your land and you can have this suitcase full of money, which is clearly more money than they'd ever seen or were ever likely to see in their lives. And they politely told the man to go away because they value their forest and their environment and their health and their culture and their traditions um, far more than they value money. But somehow in the West, we, we've kind of lost that. So I'm not answering your question. And I don't think we can put all of those people on a plane, and unfortunately, because that wouldn't help either, um, and, and, and make them live for six weeks in, in an indigen indigenous community. But I mean, to be honest, if we could, maybe we could do, uh, I did try to put together a proposal for a virtual, um, a collective virtual uh, reality experience where you walked into a dome and you would find yourself in the Ogiek forest or you would find yourself in the Indonesian jungle. Um, and maybe you could talk to um, through, you know, we could do something really fancy with technology if we had the money. Um, so you can see where I'm going, but maybe we have to do that kind of thing without traveling to educate people, to put them in that place for them to understand. But to be honest with you, we, we often say this is, about, this is about individuals making decisions, but a lot of this is about systems. These people are in systems, and systems incentivize certain things, and they just respond to those incentives. So you can educate people and sort of train people and you know, for, for within an inch of your life, but if everything in the system is driving them to do one thing, the, the, the other thing, they will still do it, as we've discovered to our cost. I don't know if other panel members want to say something else more, more hopeful or... Uh, yeah. Okay, do you want to respond yeah. and then we'll um, Just very quickly, I sometimes wonder whether there is now a disconnect between the older people who run companies and their younger staff because the, the younger generation gets it. My, my hope is that people like you will agitate for change and actually you know, uh, absorb that change and, 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 you know, consume less and, and do all the things that reduces your carbon footprint. And if all of us started to do that, that and we didn't buy whatever it is that company produces, which evidently has a, a really dreadfully high carbon footprint, then it would go out of business. So it would have to change the way it did things. It, it receives a profit because we continue to buy. So there is something here about working with younger staff members who are often very troubled by what their company is doing. But it's a job and they go and do it. And it's, it's worth looking at whether they uh, might be good allies. And then also working on consumers. I think we have to do something about educating our consumers about their power to change things. Thank you. We've got one more question at the back. Um, I'd like to ask the panel a question about the problem raised by this gentleman about the conflict between the need for people for water for daily use, just to stay alive, and the demand for water for industry and he made the point that um, even industries which are supposed to be solving the climate problem still are using lots and lots of <laughs> the same kinds of resources that are not uh, uh, replaceable that the old-fashioned industries were using. So there's a, a, a conflict. And I, before I ask my question, I'd just like to say this one, one thing about the discussion today. There's been a lot of discussion about indigenous people. Well, I've worked in Africa. It's not the main place where I've worked, but I've worked in Africa. And nobody talks about indigenous people in Africa. 
And the reason is because Africa doesn't have a huge population, except for South Africa, doesn't have a big population of uh, colonists, people who've moved in and taken over. So I think it's a bit misleading to, uh, you know, it's true that local people living in a traditional way, but they're not always people who are identified as indigenous. Anyway, but my question is this. Does anybody on the panel have any alternative to the problem of the conflict between the Western modern industrialist world trying to find some clever, you know, invented way of hydrogen or wind power, or, you know, to, to solve the problem? Um, is there any real alternative to not... Well, I worked in international I'm development. I'm just sorry. So that I would, one, one, uh, my uh, question has gone. In know, international we, development, we in for a, a long time, time here, for so a long time, the objective was to raise the standard of living. But recently, the UN has these different goals. But really, is there an alternative not to raising the standard of living and solving the problem of people who are having lots of difficulty about water and things? Is there any alternative to the rest of us living in the rich world to accepting that we have to reduce our standard of living? Well, you're saying that the standard of living is directly related to the amount we consume. It isn't. If you take the indigenous worldview and you say, what matters to me? Does it that I can go out and buy a new something to wear? Or does it matter to me that I can stand under this tree and feel the rail rain falling and know that my ancestor did that a thousand years ago? So the standard of living, there is a point at which if you don't have clean water, if you don't have sanitation, if your child might die of cholera next week, standard of living matters. But when you get out beyond that stage, the quality of our lives is, is about a lot more than the, than the industry, than the products of industry. Um, and, and that's the shift we need to make. And I think that's kind of what the younger member of the audience was, was suggesting we need to do. Can I just add in a fine? Sorry. Then. <laughs> but I'm essentially just um, adding to what Claire was saying. You know, um, in the example I gave, children are begging for food and water. And... Um, to answer your question, um, you know, younger people need to be at the decision-making table, and we need to listen to all the voices, the younger voices, the middle-aged voices, the elders, you know, we all need to be around the same table, essentially, and coming to a collective decision, because that is the indigenous practice. And again, as I mentioned to your point about talking about indigenous peoples, my, um, you know, people I'm working with are people of African descent who are indigenous to Africa. So, you know, again, maybe we, we also need to think about how we're using the term indigenous. That's it. Thank you. And there is never, ever enough time to really do justice to this um, enormous topic. But I really feel I've learned so much and I can see from the the reaction from the audience that this is um, something that we are going to take away and have lots to think about afterwards. Um, there is a space where we can actually continue some of these discussions, which is the Williams Lounge. Williams Lounge. For some reason, I've not been able to actually remember that. Um, <laughs> but in the Williams Lounge, we might be able to have some more of these discussions. Um, and so can you just join me just in thanking the speakers again? <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thanks.